This episode of Juice Crew Radio is brought to you by Try Best, making healthy living easy. Well, welcome. Welcome to Juice Guru Radio. Discover what the magic and power of juicing can do for you. And now, your host, best-selling author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Juice Fasting, Steve Prusak. Well, welcome back. I'm Steve Prusak. We're really excited. We've got a gold medalist here. Can we say gold medalist, Dossie? No, because I'm a silver medalist. Right, so I, that's what I figured. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, silver, gold, I, I, well, at least I didn't say bronze. Well, no, and you know what the truth is? The uh, gold medals are um, solid silver dipped in gold. So even the gold medalists are kind of silver medalists. So right. you know, that's down. only something a silver medalist would say, but it's true. Well, we're talking about a career that produced a medal at the 2012 London Olympic Games, eight U.S. national championships, two Pan American gold medals, and a world record. I mean, that's uh, that's a mouthful. Let's welcome to the show right now, Dotsie Bausch. What's happening, Dotsie? I mean, I mean, you know, you're you're you haven't competed, you haven't done well. Tell us what you've been doing all these years. Yeah, I, I'm kicking it on the couch with my juices. <laughs> and, and drinking the cow's milk, from what I hear. <laughs> right, delish. Yes, so good for you. <laughs> exactly. It's really exciting. I, do, I know it's all in your bio, and it's up on our website. You guys can read it, but I really wanted her to share her journey on how she became one of the top 20 badass veg women who are making history. Goodness. Well, okay. I'll try to do it a bit abbreviated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Share your whole life's journey. Um, so uh, I will f- I will fast forward to when I started cycling. Um, mm. pr- pr- prior to that, uh, prior to right before I started cycling, which was quite late. I didn't start until 26, so right. 10 or 15 years kind of after where most of my competitors did in the Olympics. Um, I was very sick with an eating disorder, anorexia, and almost lost my life to it. And via um, cycling, I... I, along with intensive, uh, amazing therapy, lots of it and many, many hours, I was able to break free uh, from the confines of uh, a debilitating disorder. And so uh, cycling in the beginning was just a way for me to um, just live healthfully uh, and, and be free and enjoy uh, the beauty of Southern California and the fact that we have sun almost every day of the year uh, and just do something physically uh, that, was, that felt great and, and wasn't um, uh, making me or, or making me feel like I was living in uh, jail anymore because I definitely had as part of my anorexia, as many anorexics do, a uh, severe addiction to overexercise, which included, you know, six, eight hours in the gym on the Stairmaster or the elliptical. So uh, breaking free from that and, and letting my body move and, and uh, kind of exercise in a healthy way again was so liberating. So that's how it started. Um, and, and I literally just kept going. I loved it. Um, I did the California AIDS ride was the first time I rode many, many miles back to back for seven days in a row. At the end of that, there was some guys that I rode with during the um, AIDS ride in the front of the pack most of the time. And they said, Hey, you should try a race or something. Cause you're, you're talented. I did the AIDS ride on, uh, on obviously it's on roads and I was on a mountain bike and they were all on, on street bikes. And so uh, I shouldn't have been able to keep up with them, but I was, and they said, you should try a race. I tried to race and just, kept going and just I loved every second of it and uh hated all the other seconds of it because it's a sport in general right you lose uh so many more times than you win but uh I just uh yeah I kept up with it in 13 late 13 years later I landed on the Olympic podium uh which was shocking to everyone and uh very much to me but well, was, that, that, that's the uh, makings of a movie right here. I mean, it's interesting because when you look back at the journey and the eating disorder and I guess some body dysmorphia going on there too, right? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. It's an aspect of, uh, of, of an eating disorder and, and, and the depth of uh, what I was experiencing. I was modeling at the time, but it, it, it wasn't connected to that in terms of, uh, you know, directly trying to be a certain person or a certain size or a certain weight or a certain look for modeling. It was, it was really just, um, it was me acting out on uh, inner pain that I hadn't dealt with and, and I needed to deal with, as is most 
addictions or disorders, right? Alcohol, drugs, right. sex, whatever. It's, it's really just your outlet for inner pain. And that's what the eating disorder was for me. Was the competitive nature there though? Were you always competitive growing up and things like that? I, I was. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I wasn't an athlete group growing up. I grew up in Kentucky and I um, mm-hmm. competed in saddlebreg horseback riding. So, you know, in that scenario, the horse is the athlete, not me, which now I look back onto and I'm just kind of horrified by the whole horse, you know, from saddlebreds to Arabians, to racehorses, to everything that we do to those animals to, you know, make them do what we want to be entertained by. But uh, nonetheless, that is how I grew up. Um, so I grew up with the very competitive nature, but not necessarily as an athlete. So um, I had a lot to a lot to learn and a lot of training to do to catch up with uh, the the women that were at a much higher level than I was when I first started racing at 27. <laughs> yeah, and being a plant powered athlete, how did that enter the equation? So when did you first learn about plant foods and and uh, you know go against the grain from what most athletes were doing? Yes, especially then. Very true. So I, I, like I said, I grew up in Kentucky. So for 35 years of my life and, you know, so for 10 years of my uh, athletic life as a professional cyclist, I ate meat and dairy and animal-based foods. I mean, I would say that was more, I was animal-based. We say plant-based. I mean, it was basically all that was on my plate, right? That's what it filled with. I mean, I grew up, um, you know, with casseroles and and brisket and Kentucky fried chicken. So that's what um, I feel myself with. And, and oddly enough, I didn't really make a connection, which is pretty ridiculous. Uh, and nutritionally, before I turned plant-based, I, I wasn't spending any time thinking about what I was putting in my body and how it would fuel my workouts and how it would help me to be a better athlete or repair or recover better. I just ate what I liked, filled my plate, you know, and ate whatever I wanted and to, to, to satiate my, my hunger from training. And some of that came from my eating disorder where I very specifically kind of made a rule or almost a law with any nutritionist or dietitian that I came across in my athletic career that I would not be weighing any food. I would not be measuring any food. I would not be counting calories. I was going to eat whatever I wanted uh, because that was the freedom that I found uh, at the end of uh, healing from my eating disorder. So when I found plant-based, the plant-based world, my entrance into it was via the animals. I was exposed to what goes on behind closed doors that is being hid from us. And I just was like, that's not okay. And I'm not supporting that. Uh, and it was just kind of that simple for whatever reason, it just clicked in my head and that made no sense. And I just said, that's it. I'm done with that. And it was, it was, it, it felt like a big transition, but then at the same time, it kind of didn't. Cause it was just like, Oh, I am not going to put misery and horror and, you know, death on my plate every day. That's just not going to be, uh, now I've made the connection. Now I can't go back. So it was kind of like this, it was an awakening for me. It was, it was almost like a rebirth. Uh, and I realized very quickly that the world of plant-based eating has about, I don't know, a trillion more options than the world of animal-based eating. I mean, what do we eat? Like four animals, five animals, maybe, you know, chicken, fish, cows and pigs, and maybe lamb. That's it. But the world of plants was were flavors opened up for me and, and that I'd never experienced before on my taste buds. And it was um, it was it was a rebirth and it was, a you know, an, an, an extension of what I felt like was uh, fairness and justice and goodness. And that just propelled me into loving it even more than I ever thought I could. And then, you know, my whole body transformed, which I had no idea that was going to happen. I knew I was loving what I was eating and I knew it was tasting good and I knew I was enjoying the journey. And I knew that I liked standing up for what I feel is, is the right thing things, but I had no idea my body was going to transform like it did. Um, No clue. In fact, I didn't even know if I would, you know, most of the sports scientists, with the U S Olympic committee were like, you know, you may not make the Olympic team eating this way. You know, so I kind of had that in my head and I also Mm. even had it in the back of my head because that's a perpetuated myth that has been going on forever inside of sport. Well, inside of life and inside of sport, it's like, Mm. you know, you need animal foods and specifically you need cow's milk, right? You need dairy uh, to to help you recover and repair because it's, you know, perfectly proportioned carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Like you can't get that from any other source. But uh, so I had that in the back of my head. 
I did. I, 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 I wasn't sure if they were right or wrong. Um, but obviously they were wrong. <laughs> well, I guess that would have been good for you if you were a baby calf. Right. That is what they need to, to remember. No, you know, it's interesting. So I didn't, they didn't show me the year that you made this transition. And I guess this was what you were training for the Olympics at that point. So how long ago was that? Yeah. So I was 35, almost 36. And that was about three years out from Olympic games, two and a half, three years. I stood on the podium at 39 and a couple months or something. So yeah, about, yeah. about, about three, about three years. So closing closer to 36. Um, so yeah, it was a, you know, I, I, that's, uh, that's, you know, quite frankly, um, is that's old for any Olympic sport. And in my discipline, I, I'm actually the oldest ever in history to even go to the Olympics um, at that age. <laughs> so, wow, that's um, amazing. you know, there was a lot of recovery that needed to happen uh, quickly because that's really what you're fighting as you age as, a, as an athlete. That's really all you're fighting. As long as you still love it, and as long as you're still passionate, and as long as your head's still in the game, you could compete until you're 80. It's just, you, if you can't recover like the young guns and if you can't recover, you can't train as hard. If you can't train as hard, you can't produce, uh, the performances that the young guns are perform are, are producing. So really all I had to fight being older was just my repair and my recovery. And if I could keep that at the speed of the young ones, I, I knew I was going to be good to go. So how, what role did the plant foods have in that? And were there any obstacles to, to that journey? Um, you know, I didn't really have any obstacles. I, I recognize that people do. I recognize it's a, it's a big transition. I recognize that some people need to take out kind of like one food at a time and, and enter in, you know, a, two or three other foods. To I, I get that. I, it just wasn't. I just knew it was, I was not going to be a party to the death and destruction anymore. And I woke up and was like, now this is my new way. And so I just figured it out. I mean, just... Uh, it, there's the internet and, and there's, you know, it, basically if you use Google and you put the word vegan in front of anything on the planet that you want to make, it cops, pops up a recipe, you know, like vegan lasagna, vegan, whatever, even vegan brisket, you know, you could find that now. So <laughs> yeah, I, mean, right. I just didn't, I didn't think it was, it was, uh, it was all that difficult. I thought it was fun. Quite frankly, I mean, it was it was like I, yeah, I, I never thought of food this way, and so uh, I thought I thought it was fun going down uh, go, going down the path of figuring out what was going to be on my plate, you know, six times a day because you eat a lot as a as an athlete. So I, I just you know, it's um it still remains fun too, which is the best part. I, I feel I feel like I'm still learning and I'm still learning new recipes and new ways to make things, and um you know, and then of course sharing that with people is a really fun part. I mean, it's interesting. There's lot. There's three different roads to get into this. It's either through health or the environment or, like you chose, through the animals. And it's interesting because I would have thought it might have been more through the health. As an Olympic athlete, you just kind of assume, all right, she's trying to get the best fuel in her body. But you went down the path of the animal rights. What was it that uh, put the light bulb on for you? Because someone, you know, we can just grow up and think that they're here for our entertainment. Yeah, and and, for, and and for our food. And if I could add a fourth reason to enter in, which is a lot of the work that we're um, doing at my nonprofit, Switch for Good, a fourth entrance point is now performance. And not just for athletes. I think for everyday active people that are maybe training for their first 5K or just take the stairs instead of the elevator, they just want to feel better. Performance is you know, what we all want to do, whether it's in, in business or in being a mother or a father, um, or in your activities, um, in your hobbies, in, in maybe in your pursuit of, um, athletics, it could be, but people want to, so you're basically, optimal. you're saying to optimize like human optimization in a way. Love it. Love the way you said that. Exactly. Right. It's not just, not everybody is, you know, dealing with heart disease or type two diabetes that that's kind of health. Right. But it, 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 you, you, everybody wants to optimize their performance in their living from, the time they get up until the time they go to bed. And mm. this is the biggest performance optimizer. It's the biggest performance hack, in my opinion, of anything that's ever been created. And there's been a lot of performance hacks, as we know, created, especially in the technology space, right? So, um, but diet is bar none, the, the biggest, um, you know, successor, success, I guess I should say. 
And would you say there is more awareness now in the physical, in the athletic community about, yeah, you know, maybe it's not so crazy to give up the meat and, you know, and the meat and the meat and the meat. Yeah. Do you mean, do I think it's becoming more accepted? Yeah. I mean, do you think, you know, it's, it's interesting when you think of like the paleo diet, because I know in my gym, right. the athletes there are all about the paleo or the keto diet and getting right. more, you know, which is basically that, that meat and the meat, right. the meat diet. I don't know any yeah. of <laughs> the you know, carnivore diet. Is, and yeah. I, I actually think of the keto diet or ketosis as they should just call it the starvation diet. Cause that's really what it is. Exactly what it is. I know the, it's the quick fixes. I mean, it's not really hard to, you know, look at the industries that are perpetuating meat and dairy. It, you know what I mean? If you just look under the hood even a little bit and you look at our food pyramid that is created by the United States Department of Agriculture, not the United States Department of Health and your best interest in mind so that you're a healthy human being. No, it's made specifically by the people who will profit off of what they put on that food pyramid. So I think if you just take, you know, people take five minutes to just kind of look at who's feeding them this information, it will inspire them to maybe look elsewhere for, for, for the right information and try, uh, you know, new ways out. But all of the fad diets, so, you know, paleo or, or keto, um, whatever they are, they, they, they seem to all just be allowing people to continue eating fat, salt, and sugar the way that they were before. So it's like, hey, you can lose weight and you can keep eating all these disgusting foods that you want to keep eating. They know that people are going to gravitate to that because no one wants to tell them to stop eating these exorbitant amounts of fat, salt, and sugar. So, I, I, you know, it's it's like, oh, of course that's going to, you know, work for a while. And then on the keto, yeah, I, I, in, on any diet, when there's calorie restriction, you're going to lose weight. I mean, that's, you know, duh. So yeah, so you can lose some weight. I don't know how you're going to be doing in 10 or 15 or 20 years. I don't know how your heart's going to be doing. I don't know how a lot of uh, the scenarios that go on and biologically are going to be doing in, in, in long term. But I, I also feel like if you just look at a, at a whole food plant-based diet, if you look at what that plate has on it, and then you look at maybe a keto plate, it just makes sense <laughs> that you would choose. Like no one's yeah. like, oh yeah, butter wrapped in chocolate frozen as a popsicle because that was one of my friends who was on the keto diet. That's what she brought for a snack one day when, and I had like my hummus and whatever. Like no one is like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Butter dipped in chocolate frozen that, oh yeah, that makes sense for health. It doesn't make any sense. Right. It doesn't make any sense to anyone logically. Now it makes sense to people like, oh, I'm going to do this and just, you know, have my fat and then, and then not have any carbohydrates and carbohydrates starve my body and I'll lose weight yet. Yeah, right. For Tomorrow you might, but you're also going to lose weight forever and keep it off and feel like a fucking champion on a plant-based diet till your T. Colin Campbell's age and beyond. So what do you, what do you want to do here? You know, it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. It's an interesting world we live in, but you know, here you are in a position where you can say, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I did it at this age, you know, one of the, you said the oldest, to compete at that level and it works and you know here you are still thriving obviously you, you know it puts you in a unique uh, position where you can really talk back to that and say yeah guys but look at me and look what i'm doing performance wise right yeah yeah for sure yeah I, I mean i think that's what um you know all the uh the athletes that are plant-based are able to share what's happened to them physically, but also mentally, emotionally, spiritually, right? It's a whole, it's a whole transformation that's beautiful and incredible. Um, but that's, they, you know, these athletes have a, have a voice. People want to know what athletes are doing. They want to see what athletes are doing to, to perform at their top. And when we talk about what goes in our mouths, it, you know, people are interested. Um, they're interested. I mean, but people are just interested in success in general. Right. But, but that, then that's exactly why the industry has used athletes forever to sell their products. Cause, cause mm -hmm. people want to emulate that. Yeah. Well, I remember growing up and seeing those commercials for the Olympics for milk does a body good. And I love what you guys have done with the, uh, switch for good, the commercial that aired during the Olympics, 
Uh, do you want to talk a little about that in case our, and we'll put a link to that commercial. You guys have to see this. We'll put that yeah. in the show notes at juicegrewradio.com. And, and of course, your website is switchforgood.org to find out more. I know the commercial's up there too, right? It is. It's right on the homepage. Okay, let's let's talk a little about that and how that happened. Yeah, so that, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about, um, er, you know, early, my early um, cycling years, and I uh, trained quite a bit at the U.S. Olympic training centers in um, Colorado Springs and Chula Vista, and inside of those training centers, there's a, uh, you know, there's so much uh, dairy and so much animal foods. I mean, it's really kind of pushed in, especially the dairy, because there is a sponsorship or partnership, uh, however you want to say it, between the United States Olympic Committee and the Milk Pet Board, uh, which started in 2008 and goes through uh, 2020. So in those years, I went to the 2012 Olympics. So in those years, you know, it was like dairy, dairy, dairy. They even have a recovery bar. I don't know if they still do. I'm imagining they do. That is literally called the recovery bar. And all that's on it are dairy foods. Um, maybe by now they've added some plant foods to it. I have no idea, but it was literally cottage cheese and yogurts and protein smoothies made with whey protein. Um, and they did have some eggs on there and then it's just dairy, dairy, dairy. Like the only way to repair recovery after a workout is with, um, you know, the, the mother milk from a cow. Like it's just, does not make any sense at all to us now, right? As we assess through it. But so that was just this, just constant, it was constantly being pushed on us and in our face. And like, this was the only food that was going to help us repair from workouts. So fast forward, obviously I went plant-based on the Olympic podium. And, and um, as I'm um, much more active in this uh, plant-based movement and environment, um, I was watching the 2018 Olympic trials for Winter Olympics and started to see the commercials, the dairy commercials that were on that were using Olympic athletes. And they, they use this uh, statement, nine out of 10 Olympians grew up drinking milk, you know, as if like what you drink as a five-year-old has something to do, whether you're actually going to be able to be an Olympic athlete. And, you know, like our parents grew up smoking and like, what do you, what's your point? It's just this, you know, pushing this into people's heads. And it says um, that it has, um, uh, natural protein and balanced nutrition. That's how they, they say it in the commercial. Um, and so I just had this like moment where I just felt like I've had enough. That is enough. Stop using us. Stop using athletes to, you know, peddle your disgusting product and, somebody needs to stand up and just say no more. We don't believe in this. There's loads and loads of athletes now that are, 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 are you know, eating plant-based or, or, and not putting dairy into uh, their diet to fuel their premium performances. So, um, you know, long story short, just got together with um, uh, some wonderful, amazing, passionate funders and um, six uh, dairy-free Olympians and, you um, Louis Facios directed it, who's the director of the Cove and Racing Race and Extinction and the upcoming um, Game Changers. And we put together a commercial that we put on NBC at the closing ceremonies of the 2018 Olympic Games. And it was, I mean, it was shocking because, you know, people had been sitting there watching the Olympic Games for three straight weeks, watching all these dairy commercials. And then we come on closing ceremonies and it's like, no you know, this is not what we, <laughs> this is not what fuels our premium performances. So that was the start of Switch for Good. Well, we also know Dotsie's in the Netflix documentary, Personal Gold, which we can, you know, learn more about your story there. And also, you, you mentioned The Game Changers, which is coming, uh, I know that's executive produced by uh, James Cameron. Do you want to tell us a little about what's coming there? Right. Yeah. So that should um, be out in, in September. Um, it, we, it, it um, was first uh, revealed at um, Sundance this past, um, not this January, the one before. So it's, 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 it's taken a while to get the, the right deal because the producers really want to have uh, the goal instead of a monetary goal is to have the most amount of people see it. So that's um, a, a great goal that they have. They have a goal of a billion people seeing it. And it is uh, an athlete fueled, uh, athlete centric um, movie that really uh, basically, again, stands in front and says, uh, you know, you've believed that, you know, you have to eat meat and animal foods to be great, 
in sport. And it goes back all the way to the gladiators times to current day to show that that's not the case. And Arnold Schwarzenegger's in it and just a, a bunch of uh, awesome athletes. And, and they do, they, they, they do a beautiful job in just kind of flipping the switch on um, what this longstanding belief has been that we need meat and we need animal food. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, I mean, he, I'm surprised that he, if I remember right in the Mr. Olympia back in uh, pumping iron days, he talked about milk being like beer. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, that's why it's so powerful to have him in it because they, cause they, they go back through his career and they show him literally eating like the largest T-bone steak anyone's ever eaten in, in the history of the world or it looked like it to me. I mean, it's like the size of a table. <laughs> and, and, and how many calories um, that he was consuming of animal protein every day um, and how many grams. It was like 260 uh, per day, how many eggs he was consuming. So yes, that's his whole history. But he has switched over to a plant-based diet for health reasons, for probably some performance, but he's not competing anymore, more for health because he was starting to have some, some health issues related to um, you know, his, his diet, which is like seven of our top 10 um, diseases in America anyway are foodborne illnesses. People think they're genetic illnesses, but they're foodborne illnesses. And so he switched over to a plant-based diet. Um, and as far as I know is, you know, 95% vegan. So it's, it's a, it, that's why the scene is so powerful, right? Cause he, he probably is the, you know, one person in history athlete wise, especially like, you know, the bodybuilders, right? I think those are the ones that we think though, they absolutely need animal protein. It's like all these other athletes, maybe they could get away with it, but not the bodybuilders. They need the animal right. protein. So it's, it's, it's really powerful. His, his, uh, his a few scenes in the movie. So, yeah. Well, we're going to look forward to that. And that, is that going to be up on Netflix or how are they putting that out? Um, I think the best thing to do is to stay tuned to the Game Changers. Um, it's Game Changers movie website um, because that's okay. exactly why it's taking a while to come out because they're working with um, you know different distributors to see what's going to be the best way for the most amount of people to see it, which is awesome. So it'll probably be on Netflix at some point, but I don't know if that's where it's going to initially uh, release from. So just stay tuned to the website. Yeah. Okay, that's GameChangersMovie.com for those taking yes. notes. And if you're not taking notes, don't worry. We'll have the link under the show notes at JuiceGrowRadio.com. And before we close out, I want to talk a little about, because some of our audience are people that are like us, entrepreneurs that are living the passion, getting the message out, and you're a great influencer spreading the plant-based message for athletes and non-athletes, and also with uh, a TED Talk uh, Olympic-level compassion that has over 175,000 views and, you know, being such a catalyst of change for people. I wondered for our certified juice therapists that are, are really trying to build a business and get their message out about getting healthy, eating plants, and things like that. What what is some of your advice for those that want to be heard above the noise? As, aside from becoming an Olympic athlete, <laughs> right? Because that, that's yeah. always that's always a plus. Winning a silver is a good way to go. Yeah, well, I think you know, but everybody has like a really um, encouraging and emboldening story. Like the power right. of personal story, you, you just can't beat it. Because the one thing that that I, that I've learned in telling my story, um, people will argue a lot of things, and they'll argue that a plant-based diet is the way to go. But no one can argue your story. No one can argue your journey because it's yours. It happened. So no one's, yes. when, when, I, when I stand up for what I believe in via my story, you know, no, no one, no, nobody's thrown, you know, eggs at my face yet because it's my story. Now, yes, it's one story and it's anecdotal. So that's why we need also, you know, the doctors and, and, and those of us that know, know the science and the research well to be sharing that, right? But people can still argue science and research. Like, you, you know, you can look in at, at the control or you can look at who funded it or you can look, I mean, you know, but you, the power of personal story is not arguable. So I, I encourage people to, to tell their journeys because that's what can people connect with. That's what really inspires people to maybe make a change, right? It's not it's it's not some some research that comes out. It's uh the the guy um Chris Chris the I can't remember he, he 
what is exactly the name of his book is, but he had like stage four prostate cancer and said no to all the traditional treatments, did the whole plant-based diet route, cured his own cancer. Now that's obviously an exceptional story as well. Like, wow, you cured cancer. Um, but everybody has their story and nobody can argue with Chris. That, that the plant-based right. diet healed his, uh, you know, healed his prostate and now he lives cancer free. Um, so I, I, I really, I'm right. And it doesn't even have to be that. It doesn't have to be that you overcame cancer. Everyone's story is unique. That's so it's like yeah. a perfect point to uh, close on, especially cause you know, the information's out there, but your story is really what separates you from, uh, you know, the billions of people on this planet. It, exactly. Right there. No, no, no one has the, no one, there are, you know, just like there's no two of the same people and no two have the exact same story. So, you know, share it, blog yeah, about it, it, journal and, it. Yeah. And, and be vulnerable in that story, share your struggles and, you know, the more vulnerable, the better. Yeah. And I what I like about you too is you're okay with being polarizing. You're, you know, you look at someone like Howard Stern and of course he was really to the extreme of polarizing, but built an empire on being polarizing and you're outspoken with this message where other people are going to say, what, you know, especially the conventional wisdom. Well, we can't really call it wisdom, but you know, the prevailing thoughts about athletic performance and it's still somewhat in the stone ages from what I'm seeing all around me. And yeah, you're saying more athletes are waking up and they're living proof. And so are you. And, but we really need that to rise above, yeah. the, um, you know, the, cause they still make fun of the vegans. Yeah, no, we still have a, a, a lot of work to do. I think that's, you're right. And that's the, you know, the Gandhi quote that, 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 you know, first they um, laugh at us or make fun of us. Um, and then they, uh, then they fight us. There's something they're missing one of them. And, and then, and then we win, but I, I feel like we are, yeah. um, we're, we're in that fight phase. Some are still laughing. Oh, I think the next one is laughing than ignoring. That's what they're not doing. Yeah. anymore. They're not ignoring anymore. Some are still like laughing a little bit. Um, but they're not ignoring. They're definitely fighting. And that's good. That's, re- that's, a, that's a good place to be because that's one step away from winning. So, I, yeah, I, you know, it's it, it. But right. Obviously, the memo has not even gotten out to. Well, but you have to look at the other hand, too. It's more are waking up. And when we look at the millennials, that 25 percent of millennials are vegan and they are this, you know, they're saying that some of the smartest people on the planet because they're immersed in this, you know, the technology, they're not learning from TVs. They're learning, you know, to find the truth that's out there. Then I think it gives us hope for the future. Would you agree? Yes. Anything to say in closing, Dots? This has been a lot of fun, and thank you for the inspiration. You have me all excited and pumped up. I know everyone listening is really excited to learn more. I shared your website. Anything else you wanted to share or how to follow you and stay in touch? Yeah, no, that's awesome. Thanks for asking. I mean, since we're on a podcast radio show, um, I'd love to to share that Alexander, Paul, and I have launched the Switch for Good podcast about three months ago. Um, But if you like what we're talking about, if you like what we're talking about, enhanced performance, um, if you like uh, understanding more about plant-based diets. And if you even want to kind of dive into uh, plant-based eating as a vehicle for um, helping either yourself or people who are struggling from eating disordered or even just disordered eating, which about 95% of the population is, that is a big topic that we tackle on the Switch for Good podcast. So that, yeah, I'll give a little shout out to that. Uh, tune in uh, for people that want to listen to multiple awesome podcasts. Yeah, boom. Thank yeah. you. Dotsie Bush right here on Juice Radio. Dotsie, thank you so much for oh, sharing. Fun. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for being here. Okay, you bet. I'm Steve Prusak, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Juice Guru Radio. Find out more about us at JuiceGuruRadio.com. Until next time, get your juice on.